Um, I'm going to play a quick video that sort of um, shows you what game fruit looks like. Oh. So I like to think of it, as, it's, it's a bit like Scratch, but for bigger kids, it's a bit more awesome. Um, anyway, we thought we were making Game Fruit for, um, for other independent game developers. My background was, oh, totally not awesome. <laughs> okay. And um, we were so, sorely wrong. Um, we launched Game Fruit thinking we were making this tool to make it better for ad agencies. We were working, doing lots of work for ad agencies back in the day. They would speed up the process of making games. And um, when we launched, like all of our users were kids and teachers, and we were like, whoa, <laughs> what do we do with this? And um, they were mostly kids between the ages of 9 and 14. And, um, and what it actually meant was that we had to learn a whole lot of stuff and um, it meant basically we had to work with teachers and students to make a piece of software with them that was for them. We had no idea how to do that being, you know, a whole lot of old people. Um, so I'm just going to switch tabs. Not that old. Um, so... Yeah, my own personal experience in secondary school wasn't the best. I really struggled to learn. And, um, you know, using the techniques that we used back in the day. On the flip side of that, I got to spend more than enough time perfecting the art of making and playing games on my Commodore 64. And um, I think the world fits into two categories. There's those that come in from the Amiga camp and those that are in the Commodore 64 camp. And I'm just putting it out there that I'm in the Commodore 64 camp, and uh, woohoo, there's a few of you out there I can see, it's great. Um, and so I'm really lucky to be in a place where I can sort of take those two life's experiences and try and weave them into the digital technologies curriculum that's coming, coming our way in the hope that kids have a better schooling experience than I did. So what, what does that mean? And it, Here's what we do as a company, and it's not necessarily in this order. So we work with selected peers in the games industry to find out the stories behind their games. We work with them to understand how they coded their games and um, the, the why behind the code. And um, then what we do is we try and align those, that rationale with different curriculum contexts. And... We can't do that alone. Normally what that means is us finding teachers, mostly teachers, say some young people, but mostly teachers and bringing them in and saying, okay, games, learning, how do we bring the two together? Um, and then what we do is we create scaffolded or step-by-step -step instructions that um, can take students to a place where they can apply their learning to make their own games. That inherently exist to be played by other people. And um, that was, I, th I first heard that from Rachel a number of years ago. She sort of said to me, Dan, you know that games are meant to be played by other people. And of course, like at some level, I knew that. But when she said that to me, it was kind of like a, something clicked. And I was like, wow, this stuff we're doing is awesome. And if we can apply this to learning, we're doing something right. And so... Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some examples of what we've been up to and then pretty much open it up for, for questioning. Um, this, what you're looking at here, is a screen from a game called Bloons Tower Defense. It's been played by over 2 billion people. Lots of those are kids. We go into lots of schools and it's awesome to walk into a classroom and see kids playing this game, like furiously playing this game, and then to be able to say, do you want to know how it was made? And 
more often than not, they're like, hell yes, we want to know how that game was made. And so in this particular course that we've developed, we've sort of, we went and met with Ninja Kiwi, a company up in Auckland, and we said, okay, talk to us about the maths behind the game. And so it turns out that the monkey is, uh, there's a whole lot of trigonometry and angle finding maths behind that monkey. And what we do is we take kids through programming the maths behind the game. And at the end of it, they've got a, a, a fairly basic understanding of um, trigonometry. This uh, example is a virus simulator that we've been working on with a guy called Patrick, who's a sci uh, science teacher at the back of the room. And um, he said, um, Dan, it's really hard to teach uh, microbiology uh, in the classroom when we're talking about viruses because they kill people. And um, it's really easy, on the other hand, to sort of talk about and teach kids, uh, what is it, ba about bacteria and fungus, but viruses is really hard. So in this example, kids place down environmental factors onto a map, they open up the environmental factors, and then they hack them, and they code them, and they're learning about algorithms. But what's really, really awesome in my mind is that they're learning about viruses and the factors that can cause them to spread or not spread. Uh, this is slightly different. Again, this is uh, called Mihi Maker, and um, this doesn't teach kids to code anything. It just takes them through the process of building their own Mihi. And um, I gave my first Mihi on Wednesday night through the process of um, going through this activity. And what was really awesome, like, you know how they sometimes talk about people dreaming in other languages? Well, when we were making this, I dreamed it. I dreamed my way through the process and woke up and went, whoa, that was really weird. That was pretty cool. And um, so for me, it was like that. It was quite meta because, you know, we're making games to teach people concepts of things. And in the process of making the game to teach people the things, I was sort of like, I started dreaming into Rayo. So I thought that was a fairly awesome experience. Um, this activity uh, is one we made with Tapapa and kids code fireflies. They have to code the um, flash patterns of fireflies so that they mate and that they're attracted to one another. And when the um, two fireflies, when you get the code right, they start flying together in like little pretty figure eight patterns. And um, so at the end of this, you've again, you've learned about algorithms, but you've also learned some of the science behind um, mating patterns of different fireflies. And that was all to do with um, and part of the recent bug, Bugs exhibition that's now passed. Um, this is something completely new we're working on. Um, we're, we're taking a whole lot of the Game Fruit content and activities that we've been developing and we're uh, appifying them. Um, and so we're working with, again, we're working with industry partners to create a suite of activities that totally align with the digital technologies curriculum. And because the Ministry of Education ha hasn't been exactly forthcoming about um, what's covered in that, we've really sort of had to look quite closely at what's been, what they're doing in the UK and what they've been doing in Australia. And um, wh what you sort of see here is the, the new scratch blocks that are coming out soon um, in Scratch 3, um, combined with Game Fruit and an app and You've got NanoGill at the top there that's going to be sort of scaffolding students through um, what they need to do and how they need to code it. Um, so what is the digital technologies curriculum? We think in a nutshell, um, because no one's talking, um, pretty sure it's algorithms and sequencing, inputs, outputs, so like making controllers, D-pads, cool stuff in games, loops, logic if statements, comparative operators, and making your code better. Uh, teachers, I want you, not like I want you, but um, um, I want your brains and um, sort of like this is exactly how I met Patrick and we started working on the virus simulator. I was at a meetup with Rachel and we were saying we're doing this stuff and we can't do it by ourselves because we don't have the expertise, we don't have the knowledge of your curriculums or your pedagogies and um, we want to take that and we want to combine it with gaming tech. And um, 
So that's how you contact me, and I hope you've had a good time, and I hope that you're not too upset about not getting to see me do interpretive dance. Thank you. Ah, oh, what? No, <laughs> there's not. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, we have some time for questions. If anybody has uh, questions for Dan. Hi. Yep. Uh huh. Yeah, we, we do a bit of that. And um, yeah, a few years ago, we were a part of the Unlocking Curious Minds initiative, and we traveled around to different schools in high deprivation areas, and we took you know, our, our learning style to them. But, um, and, and since then, we've just sort of, um, we work with different schools, different museums, different learning labs, and take, take game fruit to them. Yeah. Yeah. So last year, like Rachel and I have got a process, uh, a workshop process, where we work with teachers and we take them through the game design process. And when we do that, we're, um, we're challenging you to um, profile a student potentially with a learning difficulty. And then that workshop sort of fashioned around taking, taking you through the game design process, how to make a game that would help that student. So that's been really successful in the past. And that's a, a really good icebreaker for teachers who are going, hmm, I don't know about this gaming thing. Um, so, you know, uh, my email's up there and uh, it'd be great to hear from you some more. Any more questions? So is that what you're asking? What we look, what do we look for when we're employing people? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think. Whoa. <laughs> um, um, so I've personally always looked for people that have got a portfolio and a passion for this stuff. Um, like we've employed people that just don't care about games, and they. They, they're terrible. <laughs> um, so we, we, try to, we try to look into what they've been doing historically. Uh, um, but yeah, Game Fruit was built using JavaScript technology, so WebGL definitely features in there. And um, we chose that as a platform because um, before we started making, like the very first version of Game Fruit was designed to help people make games for the Nokia 3300. So I used, my first job was testing games. They were SMS games, then web games, then like games that were like that big. And, um, and we had this theory that we could make uh, 
Uh, there was only like 200 games in this whole ecosystem that were built in this technology. And so we launched a Facebook app. I think this was like in the first year Facebook existed. And overnight, there were more flashlight games made for the Nokia 3300 than, than at all, you know, that then existed elsewhere. So it kind of um, proved the point. But anyway, that was a flash technology. And then Flash got kind of like brutally killed by industry. Um, Steve Jobs helped do that, and um, which was kind of annoying because Adobe killed Flash Lite, and they were like, okay, we'll make a version of Game Fruit that works on the iPhone 1. And then Steve Jobs was like, nah, nah, nah not going to happen. Kiboshed us again. And um, so then HTML5 and JavaScript happened and matured to the point where we could make a... Um, make a version that uh, was industry standardized and unlikely to ever go anywhere. So we're fairly happy with our tech choice. And so when people are coding in GameFruit, they're using the Blockly technology and they're learning JavaScript. Behind the scenes, it's compiling out JavaScript. You can actually export your games and you've got the raw JavaScript, and which is another cool, cool benefit, but it's not what we focus on. Like, so we're hoping that there are other teachers out there who will be able to exploit that. Yes? No. Oh, well, if they export the game, then they can. So they can make in game fruit, then export it, and continue making once they've hit the limitations of our kind of like user interface. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think Scratch, uh, Scratch is great. It's uh, it's it's sort of lim it's it's awesome. It's limited though in in ways um, that were kind of unacceptable to us as game designers. Like, so Scratch has got like the one screen interface. You can't really you can't really make a complete game and publish it in a tool like Scratch. I mean, you can try but it's going to be really difficult. So we're, we've sort of made something where we've put some games industry practice into it, and um, you can do more faster. And um, yeah, I, I think one of the great things about Scratch is the amount of resources that they have. Um, yeah, they're, they're two different things. I think quite a lot of kids will get bored of Scratch, and then they'll kind of mature into something like a game fruit, and then they'll mature it from a game fruit and go into something like a Unity. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just always say never underestimate the, the kids and what they're, what they're capable of doing. Um, we've got some really young users in GameFruit, like the seven, in the seven to eight year old sort of demographic, and they're fine. Um, but yeah, there's other apps out there as well, like so CodeSpark is another really cool app to be, to be looking at, um, which is an app that t takes kids through building games as well. Um, Hopscotch is another really cool option. Um, yeah, so you, there's not a lack of choice, um, but our specialty is providing you with an environment where you can make a complete game that they can publish and then that they can share with others outside of the platform itself, like Scratch. 